I'd also like to start by thanking Fishbase and the organizers for putting together such an interesting symposium today. And I'm really excited to be here and to talk to you guys a bit um, about some of the work that I was involved in as part of my honors thesis. So I'm currently a PhD student at McGill right now, um, but this work really started when I was an honors student at Memorial University in uh, Newfoundland, Canada. So I'd also like to start by pointing out that this work and also this talk was really the result of um, a lot of collaborative efforts from myself and three co-authors, uh, Peter Wesley and Derek Moreau, who were PhD students at the time that we started this work and who've since graduated, um, and also our supervisor at Memorial, uh, Dr. Ian Fleming. So today I'm going to be talking about genetically modified or transgenic organisms. And trans or genetically modified plants have been in production um, for a number of years now, starting in the early 90s with the flavor saver tomato shown here. And, and this tomato has a transgene that's been inserted to prevent the tomato from making an enzyme that would normally um, make the tomato break down and make the flesh start to be soft. Um, so the purpose of this transgene is to make a tomato with a longer shelf life. And a lot of the uh, GMOs that have been developed are uh, to help improve our ability to, um, to produce food, um, especially for agriculture and aquaculture. Um, but with the development of uh, genetically modified and transgenic technologies, um, there's been considerable debate over the risks or the potential ecological and environmental impacts that could happen if transgenic um, organisms were to escape um, into the wild. And because uh, genetically modified plants have been in production for some time now, we kind of understand the potential impacts um, of escapes and especially of uh, potential hybridization between transgenic organisms and closely related species better in plants than we do in animals. And currently there are no genetically modified animals that have been approved for human consumption, uh, but this could very soon change uh, with this guy. And this is the genetically modified or transgenic Atlantic salmon. And so in this photo, um, I'm showing a transgenic fish in the background. And in front of him, that smaller fish is actually his full sibling, so it's his brother or his sister. Um, and this, this photo was taken when those fish were actually the same age. So as you can see, the transgenic salmon grow a lot faster. Uh, transgenic salmon are currently in front of the United States Food and Drug Administration uh, for approval for production for human consumption. And it's important to note that although um, they, might, they could be the first genetically modified animal, approved for production. Um, there are actually more than 30 other species of transgenic fish alone that are currently in development. So although they might be the first, um, it's possible that they could be the first of many. And so now I'd like to introduce you to a question that's going to kind of be um, an overarching question for the talk that I'm going to give today, which is could hybridization be an overlooked route for transgenes to invade wild fish populations or wild ecosystems? And unlike in plants, where we have a pretty good idea of the impacts or the potential impacts of hybridization of transgenic organisms with closely related species, um, the potential impacts of this happening in animals really are not known. Um, and we do know that hybridization is often an overlooked risk um, when risk assessments are done on these technologies. But before I really get into that question, I'd like to take a bit of a step back and talk about three different parts of this question. Um, I'm going to start by talking about transgenes and transgenic salmon. I'm going to talk a bit about how they can invade wild fish populations or ecosystems. And I'm also going to talk about hybridization, what it is and why it matters. Uh, but I'll start by telling the story of two different kinds of transgenic salmon. Um, and this story starts in a small province in Canada called Newfoundland, which also happens to be where I'm from. And it starts with a group of researchers led by Dr. Garth, Garth Fletcher at uh, a small satellite campus of Memorial University called the Ocean Sciences Center, um, which is shown in this picture. 
And in front of the Ocean Sciences Center, what you're seeing is actually the ocean covered in pack ice. And so Newfoundland can get pretty cold in the winter. And because salt water has a lower freezing temperature uh, than fresh water, um, you can actually get sub-zero ocean uh, temperatures in the winter. And traditionally, this has been a problem for salmon, aqu salmon aquaculture. And that's because um, when fish come into contact with ice at temperatures around negative 0.7 degrees Celsius, um, they can become super chilled and they actually die. So this has um, kind of restricted salmon aquaculture to the few areas of the province where ocean temperatures don't get sub-zero in the winter. But we also know that there are a number of fish that can cope perfectly fine with this really cold water. Um, and this includes fish like the ocean pout, which I'm shown here. Um, and this is because they actually produce antifreeze proteins in their blood that lowers its freezing point. So this group of researchers at the Ocean Sciences Center decided to try to make an antifreeze transgenic salmon. So to do this, they took uh, a gene for antifreeze protein from ocean pout and also an antifreeze protein gene promoter from ocean pout. And so what the promoter is doing um, for us in this case is basically it's turning on that gene. Um, it's regulating its expression and it's telling the body when and in which tissues it should be making that protein. Um, and one of the interesting things about this promoter is that it's very often on. Um, it's telling the body to make that protein in a lot of different tissues throughout the body. So uh, the researchers took this transgene construct and they inserted it into Atlantic salmon. And to do this, you inject fertilized eggs with a large number of the transgene, and a certain small number of those eggs will actually incorporate the transgene into their genome. Um, and they'll become transgenic. So then you can go through and find those fish that became transgenic, breed them with each other, and you end up with a line of transgenic salmon. So they did this and they created antifreeze transgenic salmon, but they still didn't do very well. And this was basically because they weren't producing enough of the antifreeze proteins. So transgenic antifreeze salmon weren't a terrible success, but these interesters were or these researchers were also interested in another type of transgenic salmon, um, growth hormone transgenic salmon. And there were um, a number of other groups uh, doing research on uh, growth hormone transgenic fish for aquaculture production, um, but they had a bit of a problem because no one had so far found a promoter um, that was allowing the fish to make enough of that growth hormone to really see big changes um, in growth. Uh, so this group of researchers uh, at the Ocean Sciences Center decided to keep this antifreeze uh, anti protein gene promoter, um, but instead of including the antifreeze protein gene, to include a gene for growth hormone from Chinook salmon. Um, so they took this new gene, con this new transgene construct, and they inserted it into Atlantic salmon again, and what they got were transgenic fish with very in uh, highly increased growth rates. And so things really took off from here. And when you're hearing about GM salmon now, um, these are the fish that you're hearing about. Um, the current proposal in front of the FDA uses fish that have a very similar um, transgene construct to these original fish. Um, it also has a growth hormone from Chinook salmon um, and antifreeze protein gene promoter from Ocean Pout. And these are also the fish that we were working with for these experiments. So as I said before, genetically modified or transgenic salmon grow really fast. And you can see here in the first column um, what non-transgenic fish look like at about a year of age. And then in the second column, how transgenic fish look when they're a year old. And you can see they're a lot bigger and they look pretty different. So transgenic salmon reach market size in half the time of conventional aquaculture salmon. And they actually have 10% uh, better food conversion rates. So that means that for a given amount of food that they eat, um, they can actually grow more. Uh, but we know that the transgene doesn't just influence their growth rate. Um, it has another of other, a number of influences on other traits or other phenotypic influences. 
Um, and these include that transgenic fish have a higher metabolic rate. Um, so this puts them at higher starvation risk than wild fish um, when food conditions are limited. Um, we know that they also have reduced predator avoidance and that juveniles are more willing to forage in risky situations where predators like rainbow trout are present. Uh, we know they have a reduced reproductive ability and although they um, can reproduce, they don't seem to exhibit the correct um, mating behaviors as often as wild fish do. And even when they do um, mate, they seem to make far fewer offspring than wild fish. Um, they also even have uh, reduced di disease resistance. Um, and finally, we know that all of these phenotypic influences can be heavily influenced by gene environment interactions or by plasticity. Um, so it really depends on what kind of environmental um, conditions we're studying these fish in, what kinds of influences the transgene is having on all these different traits. And this really highlights the importance of looking at transgenic salmon in as many environments as possible, um, which is especially important because we can't actually study transgenic salmon um, in the wild. They currently don't exist in the wild, um, and obviously we can't just go out and re release them. Um, so it just points out that we need to keep studying them in as many environments as possible. Um, and this is because their fitness in the wild um, is really going to depend on how the transgene influences these traits. Um, and the potential environmental and ecological impacts that they could have will be influenced by uh, their fitness. If they don't survive for very long in the wild, or if they are able to survive but they don't produce offspring, um, then these potential impacts might be lower. And so there are a number of things that could posit positively or negatively influence uh, their fitness in the wild, including we know that they have fast growth rate and um, increased size. So these fish would largely likely be larger um, than wild fish of the same age, which could give them advantages um, for competitive interactions and for foraging. So this might positively influence the fish in the wild. Um, whereas we know that because of their higher metabolic rate, um, they have increased risk of starvation. Um, and so if food conditions are limited, as they likely would be in the wild, this could negatively influence their fitness. We know um, they have reduced predator avoidance and reduced disease resistance, could, which could have negative influences for obvious reasons. Um, and finally, uh, we know that they have reduced uh, reproductive ability. Um, which could negatively influence how many offspring they actually leave. Um, but this is actually a really interesting point um, because there's evidence that their reproductive ability might actually increase if they're exposed to wild conditions. Um, we, because we have to study them in culture, um, culture conditions are kind of a compounding factor um, in risk assessments. Um, and it's possible that when, they were when they're actually released into the wild, that they might improve. And we know that this happens um, for cultured fish that are not transgenic. So there's been a lot of work done on potential ecological interactions that transgenic fish could have with wild salmon. Um, but there's been a lot less work done on the uh, impacts that they might have on other species. Um, and these ec ecological interactions could include interactions with prey species, which would be especially interesting given their um, increased feeding motivation. Um, they could also be interacting with competitor species and with closely related species, um, which is especially interesting in the context of hybridization. And it's at this point that we meet um, the brown trout, which is a closely related species to Atlantic salmon. Um, and Atlantic salmon and, hybrid, Atlantic salmon and brown trout will actually hybridize in the wild. So uh, hybridization, just briefly to go over it, is the interbreeding of two different species. And some common examples include mules, which are hybrids between donkeys and horses, and the growler or pizzly bear, um, which is actually a hybrid between grizzly bears and polar bears. Um, hybridization can occur in domesticated animals like mules, but it can also occur in the wild. And in the wild, it's often a result of the breakdown of reproductive barriers. And it appears that this is what's happening in the case of the pizzly bear. 
Um, we have two different uh, species that previously were isolated from each other, um, but because of habitat, um, or because, because of reductions um, in the habitat of both of these species, they're now coming into contact, and when they do, it seems that they're actually hybridizing. Um, hybridization sometimes produces uh, non-viable or sterile offspring, such as the mules, which are almost always sterile, um, but it doesn't always, and it appears that in the pizzly bear, uh, the hybrids can actually backcross with both parent species. So another pair of species that hybridizes, as I said, is Atlantic salmon and brown trout. And here in the photo I'm showing on top, um, a pure type Atlantic salmon, on the bottom a pure type brown trout, um, and in the middle a hybrid uh, between the two parent species. And you can see that the hybrid has um, characteristics that are about intermediate of the two parent species. Um, hybridization between these two species occurs at low rates in the wild, usually around 1%, um, but these can increase dramatically when one or both species um, is introduced or when one or both is released from culture, um, usually for hatchery stocking operations or escapees from aquaculture facilities. Um, although back crosses to brown trout in the lab have not yet been successful, um, back crosses in the wild have been observed um, to both parent species. And there's also evidence that introgression has occurred in both directions. Um, so there's evidence that Atlantic salmon genes have made it into uh, the brown trout genome, and that brown trout genes have introgressed into the Atlantic salmon genome. So introgression is just that. It's the movement of genes from one species into the genome of another via interspecific hybridization. And to think about this, we can think about the pizzly bear example, where we have a grizzly bear and a polar bear uh, mating to produce a pizzly bear. Then if we have this pizzly bear hybrid backcrossing to grizzly bears, uh, the product is a second generation hybrid whose genome is mostly composed of genes from the grizzly bear genome, but that can actually retain genes from the polar bear genome. And so if we have these hybrids continuing to back cross um, to grizzly bears, successive generations are going to have more and more of their genome um, come from grizzly bear genome, um, and they're going to appear more and more like grizzly bears, um, but they could still retain some genes from the polar bear genome. And so then we would say that those genes have integrated into the gene pool of the grizzly bears. And the question then becomes, what would happen if this happened between a transgenic species and a closely related species? Um, could we actually have the transgene becoming one of the genes um, that introgresses into the other species? So this brings us back to this question that I asked before. Could hybridization be an overlooked route for transgenes to invade wild fish populations? So our objectives for the studies um, that I'm going to be talking about today uh, were, first of all, to test the potential for the transgene um, exchange via interspecific hybridization. And we're interested in, at looking at this from the perspective of three different questions. We wanted to know if transgenic um, hybrids would be viable. We wanted to know if the transgene could influence the survival rates of transgenic hybrids. Um, and we also wanted to know if hybrids would express the transgene and if we would see that um, enhanced growth phenotype that we would expect. We're also interested in looking at all three of these questions from the perspective of the direction of the cross, so whether the hybrid had a salmon mom or a trout mom. Um, and we're also interested in whether this could actually lead to novel um, ecological interactions um, so we also were wondering if the presence of the transgenic hybrids could actually reduce the growth rates of salmon or affect their growth rates. Um, so to do this, we made a number of crosses using artificial cross um, techniques. And so we actually used like, the gametes to make these crosses. So this study can't tell us whether um, these fish would actually hybridize if they met each other in the wild, but can it give us an idea of what might happen if they did? Um, so first, to make the two types of hybrid crosses, 
we cross hemizygous transgenic Atlantic salmon. And what I mean by that is that they have a single copy of the transgene on a single chromosome. Um, and this means that uh, the transgene, because it's uh, inherited in classic Mendelian proportions, um, when we make these crosses, uh, half of the offspring of the transgenic salmon um, will also inherit the transgene and will be transgenic. Um, and half of the offspring will not inherit the transgene. Um, so they'll be non-transgenic, and I'm going to refer to those fish um, that had a transgenic parent but that did not inherit the transgene as wild-type fish. So we cross wild brown trout with hemizygous transgenic Atlantic salmon um, in both directions. So we made hybrids that had um, a salmon mom, um, and again, these were 50% transgenic. And we made hybrids that had um, a trout mom. And again, uh, these families were 50% transgenic, 50% wild type. Um, we also made two types of pure type crosses um, as controls. Uh, we cross wild Atlantic salmon with hemizygous transgenic Atlantic salmon um, to make a pure type salmon cross. And these were uh, half transgenic, half wild type. Um, and we also crossed wild brown trout with wild brown trout to make a pure type brown trout cross. Um, and none of the brown trout offspring were transgenic because the brown trout do not have the transgene. So this left us with four types of experimental groups. We had pure type salmon, AS or salmon mom hybrids, BT or trout mom hybrids, and also brown trout. And for those first three groups that had at least one transgenic parent, or that had one transgenic parent, um, we had 50% of the offspring in each family transgenic and 50% wild type. So we took these fish um, and we put 60 individuals from each species or from each family um, into these uh, tanks that were meant to be similar to the. Uh, conditions that they might experience in a hatchery. Um, so we had circular tanks um, with circular flow, and they got a lot of food, um, and they ate aquaculture feed. Um, but as I explained earlier, it's important to look at transgenic salmon um, in as many environmental conditions as possible, um, and we were also interested in potential ecological impacts. Um, so we also conducted an experiment um, in stream mesocosms. So for our first experiment in the hatchery-like conditions, um, we were interested in asking a number of questions. Uh, we wanted to know if the transgene would be transmitted into transgenic hybrids. We wanted to know if it would influence um, the survival of those transgenic hybrids. Um, and we also wanted to know if hybrids would show the enhanced growth phenotype. So for our first question, is the transgene transmitted? Um, PCR analysis confirmed that, yes, the transgene was transmitted into hybrid offspring. Um, and here in this photo, you can see transgenic fish in the first column and wild-type fish in the second column um, for all the different groups. And the first thing to notice here is that the transgenic fish were larger, and these pictures are to scale, um, and they're representative pictures from those different groups. So you can see the transgenic fish are longer and skinnier um, than their wild-type counterparts. For our next question, we wanted to know if the transgene would influence survival. Um, and here we're looking at the percent mortality, so what percent of the fish died while they were in those uh, hatchery-like conditions. And first, we're just looking at overall mortality. And the first thing to notice here is that um, while brown trout, uh, salmon mom hybrids, and salmon all had really similar um, mortality rates, mortality was actually much higher in the trout mom hybrid group. And this is consistent with work that's been done previously um, on non-transgenic hybrids between um, salmon and brown trout. Uh, for whatever reason, the brown trout or the BT hybrids um, never seem to do as well. But when we actually look at the proportion of these mortalities that were transgenic, we see some interesting things. So the first thing to notice here is that for the salmon mom, hybrids and the salmon, um, about 50% of their mortalities were transgenic. 
And this is about what we would expect, uh, because if you remember, half of those fish should have been transgenic, so it makes sense that half the mortalities were also transgenic. But if we look at the trout mom hybrids, we see that the transgenic fish also had mu actually had much lower mortality than the wild type fish. So for the trout mom hybrids, the transgenic fish were actually doing better than the wild type fish in terms of survival. Um, although you'll notice that the mortality rate for transgenic BT hybrids was still higher um, than for transgenic fish in the other two groups. Um, so we asked, does the transgene influence survival? And we saw that it did in the trout mom hybrids, but not in the other two groups. And that we also are detecting an interaction between the transgene, whether the fish um, were transgenic or not, and the direction of cross, whether they had a salmon mom or a trout mom. Uh, for our next question, we wanted to know if hybrids would show uh, the fast growth uh, phenotype that we'd expect. Um, and here we're looking on the y-axis at the standardized growth rate um, and along the x at the different groups. And first, if we just look at the wild type fish, um, we see that the growth of the hybrids was about intermediate of the two parent species and that uh, trout actually grew the fastest out of all these groups. But if we now add the transgenic fish here in black, um, we saw that, first of all, the hybrids were showing fast growth rates um, for all of those different groups. Um, within the cross, the transgenic fish were growing faster than the wild type fish. Um, and we also see that not only did the hybrids have fast growth, they actually were growing faster um, than the transgenic salmon, and this was significantly faster. And so to summarize the first experiment that we did um, in hatchery-like conditions, we saw successful transgene transmission into hybrids. We saw that transgenic hybrids were viable and that their survival depended on um, both whether they are transgenic or not and the direction of the cross, so whether they had a salmon mom or a trout mom. And we also saw that transgenic hybrids did express the fast growth phenotype. And so this experiment that I just talked about was done in the hatchery-like conditions, but you'll remember that we were also interested in looking at salmon in conditions that uh, were designed to more closely emulate natural conditions um, to look into potential ecological interactions. And so we took um, a subset of the fish that had been in the hatchery-like conditions after that experiment um, and we put them into stream mesocosms that were meant to be more similar to the conditions they would experience in the wild. So our questions for this experiment were, uh, do transgenic hybrids reduce the growth rate of salmon? And to look at this, um, we put fish into these um, artificial stream mesocosms, which I'm showing here. Um, and here I'm showing two different uh, mesocosms, uh, one on, on top here, and a second one on the bottom. And so um, each of these mesocosms had one water inflow, so we had unidirectional flow, um, which made the fish hold their position in the flowing water uh, like they would in a wild river. Um, we also gave the fish live food instead of the aquaculture feed that they'd received in hatchery type conditions. Um, and we included natural substrate in these uh, mesocosms, including several larger rocks. So the combination of the fact that we had those larger rocks present um, and that there were consistently areas that ha had higher food available um, allowed the salmon to, or allowed the fish to set up uh, territorial territories and defend them uh, like they would in the wild, but which they cannot do in the hatchery conditions. Um, and we were able to um, observe several uh, territorial behaviors in the fish in these mesocosms. Uh, so in the mesocosms, we measured the standardized growth rate of individual salmon, both transgenic salmon and wild-type salmon. And we did this using uh, passive integrated transponder tags, or PIT tags, um, which we can scan the fish with a machine, and it'll tell us which individual it was. Uh, 
we were interested in two different types of treatments. Um, we had mesocosms in a single species treatment where only salmon were present, and also um, in a multi species treatment where salmon um, were living in these mesocosms with hybrids present. Uh, the multi species treatment had two different levels. Um, we had salmon living with uh, hybrids that had a salmon mom, and a second uh, level of treatment with salmon living with hybrids with a trout mom. And so to um, visualize this, we had the single species treatment, or the salmon controls. Um, that included 24 salmon in each of these mesocosms, and we had four mesocosms for this treatment. Um, and about half of the fish that went in were transgenic, which I'm showing in this slide in the darker colors, and about half were wild type, which I'm showing in the lighter colors. Um, in the multi-species uh, salmon mom hybrid treatment, we had 12 salmon um, living in the mesocosms with 12 hybrids that had salmon moms. And again, for both the salmon and the hybrids, uh, we had about 50% transgenic and 50% wild type present. Um, and we also uh, repeated this for four mesocosms. And finally, the trout mom hybrid treatment. Uh, once again, we had 12 salmon and 12 hybrids, but this time hybrids that had trout mom. Um, once again, we did this in four mesocosms, and half of the fish were transgenic, and about half were wild type. Uh, so to look at the first question that we're interested in, we wanted to know, do transgenic hybrids reduce, reduce the growth rate of salmon? Um, in this figure, we're looking at the standardized growth rate of salmon, so we're not looking at the growth rates of hybrids yet, um, we're just looking for salmon. Um, and we're looking at it in the three different treatments along the x-axis, the single species um, and the two multi-species treatments. And if we start um, just by looking at how the wild type salmon did, uh, we see that the uh, salmon that were living in the presence of hybrids actually did have reduced growth rates. Um, and then if we add the transgenic fish to this, uh, we see that this was even more dramatic for transgenic fish, so transgenic fish's uh, growth rate was even more reduced than the wild type fish. So yes, we saw that transgenic hybrids do reduce the growth rate of salmon, um, and this was especially true for transgenic salmon. Um, and another thing to notice here is that um, there was no significant difference between the two different levels of the multi-species treatment. So uh, for the salmon, it uh, didn't really matter if they were living with uh, hybrids that had a salmon mom or hybrids that had a trout mom. Um, it reduced their growth rates at very similar rates. And so you might be looking at this figure and saying, but wait a minute, I thought these transgenic fish were supposed to have faster growth than the wild type fish. Um, and one of the important differences between the stream mesocosm experiment and the hatchery-like conditions experiment is that the stream mesocosms were food limited um, as conditions would likely be um, in the wild. And we know that transgenic salmon have um, increased metabolic rates and that they have increased risk of starvation um, when food conditions are low. So it's likely that the combination of this um, limited food availability, and also the fact that this experiment happened later in the summer when these fish were older but the water was warmer, um, combines to lead to this lower growth rate in transgenic fish compared to wild type fish. Um, and this is consistent with other studies that have been done on transgenic salmon. Um, it seems that when food availability is low, the transgenic fish just don't do as well as the wild type fish. And so we can look at this another way. And in this figure, I'm once again showing the standardized growth rate on the y-axis. But this time, along the x-axis, we're looking at the two different genotypes, um, the wild fish that did not have the transgene and the transgenic fish that did. And so um, here, we're just looking at the two different multi-species treatments. Um, so salmon living with salmon mom hybrids on the top and salmon living with trout mom hybrids on the bottom. Um, and in the top panel, um, in the salmon mom hybrid treatment, we saw, again, that wild type fish had a faster growth than transgenic fish, as we saw in the previous figure. Um, and this was also true for the trout mom 
uh, treatment, trauma hybrid treatment. Um, when we add in the hybrid growth rates here, um, because you'll remember we we're mostly interested in what happened to the salmon growth rate, uh, but we also wanted to see what the hybrids were doing. Um, in the wild type fish, which I'm circling here in gray, we saw that sa salmon and hybrids had very similar um, growth rates. But when we look at the transgenic fish uh, circled in black, we saw that the hybrids actually had um, much faster growth rate than the transgenic salmon. And we look at this in the trout mom uh, hybrid treatment, we saw that this was even more dramatic um, with wild type fish again in, circled in gray, um, having uh, pretty similar growth rates. Um, but that the uh, trout mom hybrids actually, the transgenic trout mom hybrids actually had much higher growth rates than the transgenic salmon. Um, and they actually had the highest growth rates of any fish um, in those mesocosms. Uh, so we're seeing that transgenic hybrids actually grow faster than transgenic salmon in this uh, semi-natural stream ki uh, conditions. Um, and it appears that the hybrids seem to have um, some kind of competitive advantage over the salmon, and especially over the transgenic salmon. Um, and we're also seeing that there's an interaction of the transgenesis and the direction of cross. So whether they had a trout mom or a hybrid mom, uh, with trout mom hybrids growing really fast when they're transgenic, um, but about the same when they're non-transgenic. And so once again, just to wrap these things up, in that first experiment that was done in hatchery-like conditions, we saw a successful uh, transmission of the transgene into transgenic hybrids. We saw that transgenic hybrids were viable and that their survival depended on um, transgenesis and also on the cross direction, so which uh, fish had been their mom. And we also saw that transgenic hybrids expressed the fast growth rate that we would expect. For the second experiment, which was done in the mesocosms that were designed to be more similar to nature, uh, we saw that hybrids actually decreased the growth rates of salmon and that they appeared to have a competitive advantage over their parent species, the salmon. And so what does this mean? Well, it means a few things. Um, first of all, we saw the successful first steps towards integration. Um, but for integration to actually occur, it would require a number of other steps that overall seem to be pretty unlikely. Um, largely due to the low hybridization rates between brown trout and Atlantic salmon, and also because of the low survival of um, hybrids that had trout moms. Um, and so I don't really have time to talk a lot about this today, but I'd love to talk about it over lunch if anyone's interested. Um, but it seems that, at least in this situation, between Atlantic salmon and brown trout, that trend uh, or that integration is probably pretty unlikely. Um, but we do need to keep in mind when we think about this, all those um, other species of fish and potentially other animals um, that are going to be developed for transgenic technologies in the future. Um, we saw that the hybrids had um, a competitive advantage and that if this was um, maintained in the wild, if there ever happened to be transgenic hybrids in the wild, um, that this could be potentially detrimental. Um, to wild fish populations. Um, and this also points out that regardless of the uh, likelihood of introgression actually happening, the hybrids are relevant to risk assessments because they can actually have um, ecological interactions and potentially even um, detrimental impacts on fish um, just by having transgenic hybrids present. Uh, so we see that tr hybridization does represent a potential route for the transgene to invade wild ecosystems, um, and that could include introgression, or it could even just include the presence of transgenic hybrids in those ecosystems. Uh, we saw that the transgene has complex and context-specific implications for the traits that it influenced, and this is really adding... Um, to a growing body of work that's showing these complex and context-specific implications that the transgene has on these fish. Um, and given this, we suggest that hybridization should be explicitly included in risk assessments um, that are done on the potential risks associated 
um, with any potential escapes of um, transgenic individuals in the wild. Um, and this is going to be especially important moving into the future as we potentially have um, different species of transgenic fish potentially um, coming into production for food. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank all of the people and funding agencies without whom this work would not have been possible, including Corinne Conway, Adam Fitzpatrick, Danny Ings, and Jennifer Hall. Um, I'd like to also thank the employees of Aquabanti Technologies, um, which is the company that makes these transgenic salmon for providing uh, transgenic gametes. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Fleming Lab at, Memor Fleming Lab at Memorial um, for support and suggestions throughout this process, and more recently, the Hendry Lab at McGill. And I'd also like to thank all of you guys for attending. Um, and I don't know if we have time for questions or not. Thanks. <laughs> thank you very much. Questions for Crystal? Yes, there is one. So we know that there are genes that could cause immediate reproductive incompatibilities, so-called mm -hmm. speciation genes that have been discovered in organisms like Drosophila. I'm thinking of the Odysseus locus in particular. Has there been any discussion of finding regions of the genome between brown trout and Atlantic salmon that perhaps never intergress, that might be associated with a high degree of uh, reproductive incompatibility and transfecting these uh, transgenic fishes with those speciation genes as well. In a sense, you would, guarantee, you, would, you would help potentially guarantee that any hybrids would be less viable than the natural hybrids. Yeah, um, that's really interesting and I don't know if anyone's looked for those genes um, in these hybrids. Um, generally, there's not a lot of work done on these hybrids, um, so I'm not sure if someone's looked, but that's a really interesting idea. Um, and I should also mention um, that the current proposal that Aquabounty has, they have a number of other um, uh, things in place that should prevent hybridization in the wild. Um, for example, they're using land-based facilities, um, which should really reduce the risk of escape. Um, and they have a few other um, things that should really minimize the chance um, of these hybridizations happening. Um, but it would also be really interesting to see um, if those other species are, are developed, um, if they hybridize with other animals, and if there might be some of those genes in those hybrids. Yeah. We have time for one more question, if anyone would like to venture. Which gives me the opportunity. Um, <laughs> Do you think it's possible that there is more frequent hybridizations between salmonid species because they had this genome doubling event? Maybe the whole genome is in a more flexible uh, situation, more flux. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't really know. Um, I do know that when these hybrids um, actually happen, really weird things happen with you know, what chromosomes even they get, um, which parts come from uh, the different parent species, because they're pretty different. Um, so yeah, really interesting things are happening there, but uh, I'm not sure about your, your first question. All right, then before we let you go, let me hand over the gift from the museum. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.